started here. Let's see if I'm working or not. Is that me? All right, that's me. Is that me? Yeah, that is me. Okay, good. All right, praise God. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. I'll tell you what, it's just good to experience those times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. And sometimes you experiencing a, you, you experience a strengthening of the Lord. You know, I love how wonderfully vague the Lord puts it in his word, how we can be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. There's no answer. There's no breakthrough. There's nothing I'm seeing. There's just a strengthening that comes from the presence of God. And sometimes the answer is he just gives us the strength that we need to get through things, to endure things. And I just sensed that supernatural, like that word said, just lifting you up with both hands, strengthening you, standing by you, and letting you know I'm here. So receive that breath of the Spirit this morning to strengthen you. Praise God. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started here in Luke chapter 17, verse 11. And it says, as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And he looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell down to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. quite an amazing story here where you've got 10 guys, lepers, if you can kind of imagine, picture the scene, they're standing off there and, and they're shouting out at a distance because they were very restricted by the law, what they could and what they couldn't do and all this stuff. And they were probably, you know, on the fringe of, you know, breaking some of those even as it was but they were very restricted in terms of their movement and all that. So they're standing at a distance. They're crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And, um, and then what does Jesus say? He says, go show yourselves to the priests. Now, why would he say, go show yourselves to the priests? Because as they would get healed, ultimately, they would show themselves to the priests, and the priests would then release them from all these legal restrictions of being a leper. They wouldn't, they'd be declassified as lepers in the eyes of the priest, and they could just mingle and go back to normal life again. So that's what he was saying. Go show yourselves to the priest. And so he was really giving them a full restoration of their life, healing of their bodies, and a return to societal norms again to be a regular person, you know, and all the, the freedoms that they would normally enjoy. And, of course, as they go, there was one guy who came back praising God. He was just amazed. And Jesus was amazed, too, because you can imagine leprosy. This would take you out. This is a, a disease that could absolutely take a person out, and, and you have leprosy one moment, and then the next moment you don't. And this guy was so appreciative that he came back and he just had to say, and it wasn't just like a little high five or knuckles or something. He was shouting, praise God. This was a public, shameless declaration. I'm healed, I'm healed, and I don't care who knows. That's what he was doing. He was just laying it out there. Thank you. This gratitude, and that blessed Jesus, you could tell. Now, you got to understand that what we're reading here this morning is not you know, Jesus telling a parable of the 10 lepers. And the Samaritan came back because Samaritans are people too. No, this is not a parable. This is a true account of something that really happened. 
And this foreigner had an appreciation that people who had been around the things of God their whole life didn't really seem to have as much of an appreciation as this foreigner had. And I'll tell you what, there is a lesson here for all of us, especially as we look at this story. Because we can be around the things of God, we can develop sometimes almost, um, I don't know, a lack of appreciation, gratitude for the things of God. And I'm telling you what, it is so important. Gratitude is such a big part of what makes our whole Christian walk work right. And this morning, we're going to just be taking a look at that. And it's simply called Gratitude 101, all right? We're going to talk about gratitude this morning, but we're going to talk about it in the simplistic terms that the Scripture talks about gratitude. This will not be complicated. It will be so simple. You want to complicate it to get away from the simplicity of it sometimes. But it's not supposed to be complicated. It is simple, and it is freeing. Gratitude. Jesus was blessed by that man's gratitude. And gratitude is the truth. You know, it's so simple, but it's one of those basics that we have to get back to in our life, especially when life gets complicated. We try to get complicated. And when life gets complicated, many times the Spirit is going to lead you back to simplicity again. Simple truths. And this is a big one. It's simply gratitude and appreciation for what God has done for you. Now, I don't know who these guys were. We'll call the guy who came back uh, Larry, Larry the leper, all right? I don't know if that was a good Samaritan name or not, but we're going to go with it this morning. We're going to learn lessons from Larry the leper this morning. He's gonna, we're going we're gonna to let him teach us some things. It was pretty simple what he did, but I'll tell you what, sometimes there's just a, that we need that goes, oh yeah, wow. First of all, it's a three-lesson class this morning in Gratitude 101. The first lesson is this, gratitude for salvation. Just a simple gratitude for the fact that we are saved. The scripture says, this is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to start up a brand new religion. No. No. He came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. He came into this world to save sinners. In his timing, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. There is a sense of appreciation that we return to the fact that I was a sinner and I'm not a sinner anymore, right? Larry the leper, he was a leper, and then he saw he wasn't a leper anymore. And he had to go back and he had to worship God. He had to thank God for it. You know, that's why we have a call many times to return to your first love. You're not going back to a place of spiritual maturity. Of course, you mature and grow as you walk with the Lord. But there's something special about your first love. There was this awareness that you were one way and now you're another. I was blind and now I see. There is such a fresh appreciation for the miracle work that God has done in your life that he saved you. There is a returning back to an appreciation, to the joy of your salvation. I'm saved. I'm born again. Praise God. When I wasn't born again, there was a sense of doom. There was, there was a sense of pending fear. But now that's gone. Praise God. We got to have a gratitude for salvation. Sometimes to do that, we got to look at where we've come from. We're going to take a look at a, a few sobering scriptures this morning. 
He came as a savior. We're saved by his love, but we are saved from a real hell. You know, if we lose sight of what we've been saved from, we can lose our gratitude. We were saved from a real hell. This is John the Revelator saying, I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. The books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire, This lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. There's two judgments at the end of the age. This is what we call the great white throne judgment. The other judgment is the judgment seat of Christ. This is where believers go to be judged according to their works in a way that they're rewarded according to their works. Everybody has their day in court. When Jesus said, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, that wasn't being set out of some religious insecurity, and this is what I'm familiar with, and this is what I like. No, this is very practical, legal, he's talking. In other words, whether you believe in Jesus or not, you're going to have your day in court. This will be your day in court. You will stand before a holy God on the basis of your deeds You're going to go through a moral audit without grace. You're going to go through a moral audit without any mercy. And nobody's, anybody whose name was not found in the book of life that was by grace through faith was thrown into the lake of fire. That's a real place. It's a real place of torment. It's a real place of separation. When Jesus came as a savior, again, it wasn't to start up a new religion. It was to save us from a real hell. We needed a savior. This was serious business. When Jesus is in Gethsemane and he's sweating as it were great drops of blood, he's come to save us from that place. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God And on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus, they will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe, and this includes you. For you believed what we told you about him. You're saved from hell. You're saved from eternal destruction. Man, there are times in my life when I got to shake myself and remind myself, Ed, you're saved. You're saved from the punishment of sin. You're saved from a really bad place, any place of eternal destruction. Yeah, I don't want to go there and dwell in there and live there, but I I want to be reminded what I'm saved from. I I want to remember what Jesus foresaw, why he came for me at the right time. He saved me from a real hell. I was going to hell. I got saved. I come back and I say, thank you. Man, when we're in heaven, we're going to be declaring, worthy is the lamb who was slain who redeemed us to God by his blood and made us kings and priests forever. When we're in heaven, we're going to be having a deep sense of gratitude that we're there because of the blood of Jesus Christ. There is an an intentional need to say thank you. I'm not going to hell. We sing that song, Hell Lost Another One. I am free. Hell Lost. That's a real place. There are people that are not going to hell, us, who are going to a real place called heaven because of Jesus Christ. I'm grateful. I go back there and say, thank you, Lord. I'm delivered from hell. I'm saved from hell. I'm saved from that place of torment. I'm in the family of God. Glory to God. Not only was I saved 
You know, in terms of a gratitude for appreciation, not only was I saved from a real hell, but I was saved to a real heaven. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of decay. And though you're, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last day for all to see. For I consider the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Wow. What a stark contrast. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It's not good. But we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for that peace. Thank God he did what he did. He came to save me from a real hell. I don't take that for granted, in other words. In other words, the rest of my life, I'm saying, thank you, Lord. I appreciate what you did. You know, if God wanted to be vindictive toward man, if God just wanted to, you know, give man his, all he would have had to do is nothing. No, just he did something. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You are saved because you made a decision for Jesus. You're not saved by an association with anybody. You're not saved because of what your parents believe or you know so-and-so. You are saved because you recognize your own sinful condition and you call upon the name of the Lord and you receive forgiveness and you experience a new birth and you're born again. You're saved. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Man, we're saved. Whew, I'll tell you what, sometimes when you're obsessing over who says what and somebody looked at you funny and all that, you just need to come back to this sometimes. I'm not talking about a 30,000 foot view, I'm talking about a 30 million mile view. Hey, I'm saved. You know, when I've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, not only will I have no less days to sing his praise, but I won't even be thinking about these little things. The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. There is something about stirring up an appreciation for the fact that you're not going to hell. Man, thank you, Jesus. What did Larry the leper, he realized he was one way and he's another way. Yeah, we're believing God for some stuff. And yeah, we're believing for things to change. And we've got, but I'm telling you what, the biggest fish has already been fried right here. You're on your way to heaven. This life's a vapor. We have cause right now in the face of why God questions to rejoice in the fact that God has saved us. He did what we couldn't do ourselves. There is an appreciation 101. I'm saved by grace through faith. I have cause, praise God, to be happy. And that's where Christmas we celebrate. You know, for there is, you know, There is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, cause for great joy. Praise God. Also, lesson number two, gratitude. There's a gratitude for our salvation, but there's a gratitude with purpose, okay? In other words, our gratitude isn't just a happy feeling. Our gratitude has purpose behind it. 2 Corinthians 5.15, we have a person to live for, Jesus Christ. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. That's the new living. This means all died with him so that those who live should no longer live self-absorbed lives but lives that are poured out for him, the one who died for us and now lives again. In other words, he's saying, this is right. This is just simple gratitude that the one who died for all, that we should live for him. 
It makes sense. And I love how the Passion puts it, that we are no longer to live self-absorbed lives. And again, it's not preaching this, this this morning. I'm not preaching down. I'm not preaching it from a place of condemnation, but I'm just preaching it from a place of you've got the one leper and you got the nine lepers. We've been both. We've been the nine. We've been the one. But this is a message this morning for kind of a heart check. Say, Lord, man, where am I? Where is my gratitude right now? It's right. You died for all. I don't want to live self-absorbed lives. I'm not down here to keep up with the Joneses. There's just such a, an obsession. I remember we, we watched that little um, Veggie Tale every year, the toy that saved Christmas, and there's a line in there where um, there's this one of, the little, one of the little peas or whatever. You know, he's talking to his dad, and he's saying, he's crying, he's crying. He says, Billy has more toys than I, I have. And his dad says, who's Billy? He says, I don't know, but he has more toys than I do. <laughs> And, um, you know, it, it, it captures something there because when all of a sudden the big thing in our life is whether we do or don't have that thing, and our happiness is going to revolve around something, there's something that's not quite in perspective there. He died for everyone so that those who live will no longer live for themselves. You got purpose. You got cause. You got a cause to live. Is there a cause? Yeah. Not only did he save you, but man, he gave you a purpose to live for. I like how Paul puts it this way in Romans. We have not only a person to live for, but a way to live. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, this is new living, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. So Paul's telling us here, first of all, when you look at that Romans chapter 8, he's talking about two different ways to live. There's two paths. You can live the way of the flesh, or you can live the way of the Spirit. And Paul comes back and lets us know something. He says, dear brethren, we are debtors. All right? We are debtors. And he says, I'll give you a hint, it's not to the flesh. But we are debtors. We have no obligation to our flesh, but we have an obligation to our spirit. We made Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. There is something fulfilling and satisfying in this obligation. This is not an obligation of religious duty. This is an obligation that we have that is connected to the good works he's ordained us to walk in, to fulfill the divine purpose that he's put on our lives. There is a way to live. There is a way to walk that's connected with. What are we talking about? Gratitude. I'm, I'm, living, I'm living for God, not, again, not from a place of religious duty, but from a place of gratitude. And I'm a debtor. It means I have an obligation. This is not me trying to pay for my salvation but it's an obligation that I have to my Lord to walk for him. This is important. This is important because this is where it kind of gets to right here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service. New living. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Gratitude, 101. He's saying, offering our bodies, it's reasonable. It's rational. It makes sense what he's done for us. You know, the world that we live in will feel sorry for us for our faith, what we have to do, maybe commitment, coming to morning, it's Sunday morning, coming to church, or I would never forgive, I would never do this, I would never do that, you know, and have a bunch of a sympathy and pity for you and look down on you um, because 
they don't have an appreciation for salvation. They're living in a, in a blind, from a blind perspective. They have no appreciation for what Jesus did. And when they see you living for God, they just think religious duty. But it's not religious duty. You appreciate the one who saved you. You have a sense to live for the one who gave himself for you, a sense to walk in the spirit. You realize, offer oh, my body, pff, that's just my reasonable service. I've been bought with a price. Not a big deal to glorify God in my body and spirit, which are God's. You understand? But we live in a world that pulls on our consecration to God, that causes us to get in our head and feel sorry for ourselves, that causes us to want to see things. That's why the scripture goes on there. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. The world is going to pull us down to a place of self-pity. Gratitude is the reasoning of scripture. Gratitude says it makes sense. He gave himself for us. We're just offering what we call lordship of our life back to him. We're letting him use our body, our mind, our spirit. There's an exhortation to say, this makes sense. Stop feeling sorry for yourself, Ed. I don't have to feel like you have to live for God. And I, I was saved from hell by a Lord who loved me and gave himself for me. It is right, it is appropriate that those who live for him should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. What is this? This is a shaking message. It's shake up gratitude. We owe him our lives. It's right, it's appropriate. I offer my body as living sacrifice. It's reasonable, it's rational, it's intelligent. Give your body because of, uh, let them be a living, holy sacrifice to God. But to understand it from that place of gratitude, we sing a song around here. And this is just an excerpt from it. It's called The Goodness of God. But it says, All my life you've been faithful. All my life you've been so, so good. With every breath that I'm able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything because your goodness is running after. It's running after me. I'm living for him who died for me from a place of gratitude, from a, a place of his goodness. I'm coming back. I've been the nine. I want to be the one. I want to come back and say, wow, I am saved. I don't take your salvation for granted, Jesus. I don't take what you did on that cross for me for granted, I don't take those nails and the blood for granted. I don't take the ridicule for granted. I see it. That's why we have a Good Friday service where we force ourselves to take a good hard look at what he did for us on that cross. And we need to, from time to time, still take a good hard look and say, I don't, I don't take that for granted. You did it for me. You experienced that for me. Thank you. There are some big things in life. There are some compass orientation places of the heart that have to come back in line in gratitude. It's just, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. You saved me. Praise God. It's reasonable. I've been bought with a price. It's reasonable that I glorify God in my body and my spirit, which are God's. What am I doing? This, I'm just, just talking to myself here. If there's a second sermon there for you, have yours to hear what the Spirit's saying. But there are times I feel sorry and I got to shake and say, no, Ed, this is reasonable. What happened here? Why, why are you here? You're a Christian. Jesus died for you. It's going back to those basics. Because no matter who does what or no matter who says what, or no, it doesn't change this. And this is why I'm grateful. Pray. I'll tell you what, if your gratitude can be so grounded in what God did for you, you cannot be shaken. You cannot be shaken. There is a gratitude that's based on him. Praise God. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that's like, praise God, it is. It's, it's from a place of gratitude. Now, we can appreciate what he did for us, absolutely, and, and things happen in life, and we don't understand this, we don't understand that, but I'll tell you what, no matter who, what happened here, what happened there, who didn't do what, it, again, it doesn't change what Christ did for you. And that's what the Lord spoke to my heart, you know, several years ago. He said, Ed, no matter what anybody does to you, it can't undo what I did for you 2,000 years ago. But you know, we can let it undo that. 
not in a sense of spiritual new birth, but we can let it undo the gratitude that we have for him. We can allow people's stuff and things that we go through to undo the sense of gratitude that we have. We're always, what what is gratitude? It keeps the main thing the main thing. I'm saved by grace through faith. I'm stirring myself up, praise God, in the fact that I'm a child of God, that he loves me, that he is he is for me. That's a, that's a lesson of gratitude with purpose. And then finally, there's a lesson of gratitude with mercy. This is some heavy lifting stuff that, again, if we try to do the religious duty stuff, we're going to get burned out. We're going to feel sorry for ourselves, martyr complex of all the great things that we've done. This is where the, the healthy inflection of gratitude keeps our heart in the right place as we're serving God. Hey, I'm just doing what I'm called to do, praise God. And then there's gratitude with mercy. When you combine gratitude and mercy, that's another powerful combination that keeps our heart right. Um, so this is a parable that Jesus told. He said in the process, he said, uh, talking about a king collecting his debts and debtors, getting the accounting of his debtors. In the process, one of his debtors, the king's debtors, was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave him the debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I'll pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison until the debt could be fully paid. So here Jesus is telling the story, a parable about the hypocrisy of somebody who needs, begs for, and receives that mercy, but then turns around and won't show it to somebody else who also needs it. Now, when we look at this parable... The obvious fact is that this guy who received this millions of dollars of forgiveness and turned around and was going after a guy who owed him much less, the thing that he lost sight of was his great debt that he had been forgiven. He lost a sense of gratitude of his own forgiveness. And that sense of gratitude, when you, don't, you can know the theology of your forgiveness. I'm not talking about theology this morning. I'm not talking about theology and any of this stuff. I'm talking to believers who know God, who love God. I'm talking about gratitude 101 this morning. I'm bringing it back down to intentional thankfulness to God for what he's done in our lives. Coming back to that place. Man, I was a sinner on my way to hell and I got saved by grace through faith from a God who loved me and who's for me and gave me purpose to live for him that's going to impact the outcome of eternity based on what he's put in my heart to do. Pretty significant stuff. And then he calls me to another way. He uh, calls me to another way. That's the, in other words, when I am living my life for him, when I am laying down and I'm choosing the ways of the Spirit, and I'm choosing to do things his way. I'm letting my body be a living sacrifice. You know what I'm doing? We think, well, that's religious duty, that's sanctification. No, that's you saying thank you. That's your way of saying thank you. That's, there's a thank you in that. That's what I want you to see this morning. How do we come back and say thank you when we honor him? That's how we're saying thank you with our lives. There is an expression of gratitude when we do what he wants us to do. We remember what he's done and we express that gratitude back when we live for him. But here's another big way we say thank you right here. After he has forgiven us and we've got a debt against us, do we keep the person in prison or do we release a person? Jesus said, He said that that the fellow servant fell down before and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me. I'll pay it, he pleaded. But the creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. So there was a prison. We call this bitterness. But we're called to do something when it comes to the prison of bitterness. If you have, if you can imagine in your mind, I'm kind of talking allegorically, but if there is a bitterness prison, if you were, how many people are in, are in your prison? 
right now. This is what we're called to do as New Testament believers. Get rid of all bitterness. Let all the prisoners go. Rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Here's the simple logic again. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. What is this? This is just gratitude 101. How, am, I, am I forgiving somebody because of my great magnanimity and my ability to be above the fray? And No, I'm forgiving somebody from a place of gratitude. I'm going to a place of gratitude. Now, this is big. We talk about forgiveness from a lot of different angles and a lot of different perspectives, and there's a lot of different ways to climb up the mountain when you're talking about a Bible subject. But I'm going to climb up the mountain of forgiveness this way this morning, from the perspective of gratitude, where we are like that servant. But instead of just putting that person in our prison, we go back to the master and we remember that million-dollar debt. Now, you, you see the technical reference. Forgive one another. Christ forgave you. Christ forgave you. That's the simple logic. That's gratitude 101, right? That's the way it works. But there's something powerful about gratitude. In other words, gratitude will soften your heart in a way that you can forgive others. You're not forgiving somebody from the strength of your personality. You're forgiving somebody from the humility and the appreciation and the grateful place and heart of what God has done for you. In other words, if that servant who wouldn't forgive his brother would have spent some time and went back here, said, wow, he forgave me everything, and looked at that and appreciated it, There's a reason those nine didn't come back. You know those nine that didn't come back? They probably had better theology than the one who came back. Those nine who didn't come back, they could probably argue scripture better. They could probably have apologetics, but there was one thing that the guy who came back had that the other nine didn't. He had gratitude. He had an intentional appreciation to say, thank you. There's a humility in that that God gives grace to. There's a humility in gratitude that fills your heart. This is why we're called, you know, in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, be filled with the Spirit, you know, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Like this morning, when you begin to sing and worship God and you get into a place of appreciation for His great mercy and compassion for you, when you're in that place, forgive from that place. Get, there's things you'll do when you're filled with the Spirit that you won't do when you're not filled with the Spirit. And if you're having a hard time doing what the Word says to do, get filled with the Spirit and do it from that place of gratitude. Remember Peter? He said, I'll never deny you, Lord. Three times. Denies him, weeps bitterly. But then there was another time in the book of Acts when he's brought before the who's who of Israel and he's called to give an account for a healing. And these are the, the people he was fearing the most. But it says, but Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said there is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. Wow. Same guy. Filled with the Holy Spirit, not filled with the Holy Spirit. What are we talking about this morning? We're talking about getting filled with the Spirit, getting filled with gratitude, getting into a place of gratitude and begin to function there. Do you know when you get filled with the Spirit of God, and, you, and that's why it's good to sing songs that remind you of His amazing grace and getting before that million-dollar debt place that He has shown in your life. Get filled with the Spirit, and from that place again, forgive from there. You understand? That's not emotional hype. That's a spiritual exercise. Getting filled with the Spirit to the natural man could look just emotional. As spiritual people, we know better. When you get filled with the Spirit, when you're setting your mind on things above, it's not just an emotional feeling or an endorphin. It's the law of the Spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus that goes to work. 
that makes you free from the law of sin and death, that makes you free from bitterness and hatred and wrath and anger. There's a spiritual strength and power, but it's going to start with gratitude. In other words, I'm not starting with my breakthrough. Or starting with, I'm starting with what he's done for me. I love because he first loved me. As long as I've got his first love for me to go back to, I got a starting place for gratitude. There's a gratitude this morning. There's a gratitude exhortation in all this. Gratitude 101. And again, I'm talking to me this morning. I'm talking to anybody who the Lord is showing you that you need to hear this. But I'm just telling you what, sometimes this has been my, my missing link here. Like I said, those nine lepers that were familiar much more with Judaism and a lot of the different ways, perhaps, and history and people and no people and all that, you know, they were content to just keep going on. Maybe they had some pats on their own backs or people who they thought were, I don't know. But this one guy, he said, wow, I was lost, but I'm found. I was blind, now I see. There is a gratitude that we got to come back to. It's a gratitude where I'm coming back and saying, thank you, Lord. What is the action for a message like this? Man, it's going into the presence of God. It's just going into the presence of God and saying, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for loving me. I see it. Yeah, I got a life I'm living for you, and I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. I got to live. No, you're worthy of my life. I am bought with the price. I'm not going to conform to the seducing spirits and the pattern of the world that says you deserve better. I deserve hell, but I got saved from hell, and I'm living for one, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of my life, and he's given me his word, and he's given me his spirit. And I'm telling you what, there's a, like I said, there's like a shaking that says, this is life. Because when your spirit leaves your body, this reality is going to be stark. And this is where we got to shake ourselves before our spirit leaves our body and says, I'm going to live my life for him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. It's my reasonable service. It's not too much. It's right. It's appropriate because of his great love. Heavenly Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus this morning. And Father, I just pray that that exhortation this morning, an exhortation to gratitude, to thankfulness, to not be like that servant who looked away at all the amazing debt that was forgiven him and obsessed over his brother, over his sister. Father, I pray that our hearts would be turned toward you this morning, that each of us, Lord, would begin to see and know we have so much to be grateful for. Go ahead and make this a declaration of faith if your heart can agree. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I love you because you first loved me. While I was a sinner, you came to my rescue. Jesus, you died on a cross for my sins. You came to save sinners and you saved me. Thank you. I'm so grateful that I don't fear that day to come. Men's hearts are afraid of that day. I'm not afraid of that day. I can eagerly wait for it. I can look up. My redemption's drawing nigh. I've been saved for a real heaven. And I've been saved for a real purpose. You gave yourself for me. I commit fresh and anew. I'm on this earth for just a few years. And I'm going to give these years back to you. To live for you. To serve you. It's reasonable. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, help me to look and to remember your suffering on the cross. You died for my sins. And you died for all the sins of those who sinned against me. I show mercy, Lord. I stir myself up. I'm forgiven. I'm blessed. I look at the million dollar debt 
and I'm grateful. And I forgive and I release all the prisoners from the cells of bitterness. And I say thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, when I think of all the different ways that we can come back and say thank you to the Lord for what he's done for us, I think that's one of the biggest ways we can do it. Somebody sinned, they did this, they know it. And you say, yes, and I forgive them, Lord, even as you've forgiven me. That's like the biggest thank you to God you can give. I forgive because you forgive. You know, it's evidence that you've received his forgiveness when you can forgive somebody on the basis of the fact of his forgiveness for you. These are just different ways this morning we're talking about that we say thank you, that we show our appreciation. It's a gratitude message. This is not a theological message. Again, like we said, those nine lepers, they knew their Bible, but there was something they needed. They needed a, this is for real. I love you. You're going to be in heaven with me forever. Ah, oh, see it, know it. Don't look away from it. <laughs>